say thank you very much to the different presenters, to Joachim, who presented twice, to Sam Wagner and to lastly to Scott Laundry. then. It takes a bit of time to prepare what they prepared and then there's the time actually spent now. So we're very much indebted to the um, three of you and uh, thank you very much. And really I hadn't thought much about what Joachim said, but it was sort of a little bit unique to have us in three points of the globe all coming together to deliver this for you guys today. So as I said, thanks for the effort. I'm just going to grab some key points from each of the presentations. So Joachim spoke to us first about step one, where we understand our direction. And one of the things, I got three important messages there, is that teams, if they're going to perform well, need an overall direction. So for teams to perform well, it's this purple bit, they need the overall direction of a challenge. Otherwise, it'll be random improvement heading in a number of different directions. And I think it was at this point, Joachim, that you, that uh, he got a question about can we have different target conditions coming from different swim lanes all aligned to the one challenge? Well, this that slide almost perfectly illustrates that yes, you can and yes, it makes perfectly logical sense. If we think of each of these three as a swim lane, three here, then um, they're all focused on the one challenge and that that's perfectly logical, does happen in reality. Um, and the second point I got out of this, I think it's important to make, is that the challenge is top management's opportunity to make the vision, which always sounds way out there and almost unbelievable, a little bit more meaningful and real. So a lot of companies have visions and vision statements, and I'm a bit skeptical about most of the ones I see, to be honest. Um, but uh, they are way out there. And I think for staff who are coming in day-to-day -day work, uh, they're probably way out there. But what the challenge does, it gives an opportunity for top management to connect day-to-day -day activity on the shop floor, the experimenting to target conditions and connect to, to the vision and bring some reality to it. Um, and the third point that Joachim made there was that not knowing how is okay. And that was a, when I, I remember when I was handed the book Toyota Carter to read by a guy in Vietnam in 2011, and he told me I needed to read it. I remember one of the lines in it was where it actually states that, that uh, no plan needs to cover everything and that is okay, is pretty early on in the book. And I remember reading that and thinking, how can that be? And I've spent my life, I was trained to be a, to write project plans. I'd spent probably 25 years at that stage writing project plans. And that to me was really confronting. But, but in time, I've got over that. And, and what I realise now is that it's actually extremely liberating. If you can get your head around, no plan will cover everything and that's okay. It's extremely liberating because you don't have to have a plan. To be able to achieve a goal, to be able to achieve a next state, you don't need to have a plan. But you still need discipline and that's what I woke up to. And it's the discipline to practice the improvement carter and the coaching carter, to follow these patterns of scientific thinking. That is your plan. The plan becomes follow a pattern of scientific thinking. If you adopt that plan, I can pretty much ensure you'll get wherever you want to be, uh, in whatever stage you want to be at. Um, and I'll just quickly flick to um, a couple of other things that Joachim said. And that I've certainly learned from Joachim in the last six months, he's sort of stressed this. And this is that we need to consider elements of a challenge and they usually do blend. In other words, if we just focus on quality, we may we can achieve quality, but that we can achieve it by spending money or, um, or by sacrificing production or sacrificing safety. And the challenges need to have more than one element. And the second aspect to that is that, and tied in, is that there's a balancing aspect to all challenges. In other words, we can achieve our quality, but uh, at a certain cost or whatever that may be. And it's and what I've learned from Joachim as much as anything in the last six months is that that is what makes it a challenge. Just achieving a quality goal on its own may well, may well not be challenging. We can do that with a new machine or we can spend a lot of money or we can do something. but to, to consider other aspects and then the balancing aspect is what actually makes a challenge a challenge. And I think that's a really important um, message to come out of it. And also the other thing Joachim said that I haven't heard him say before was the aspect of mental safety. I think that's critical. I have an organisation I do a lot of work with who, uh, who 
who recently achieved their challenge or ha were achieving their challenges, but what they've had a bit of a, um, a backward step in the last sort of six, 12 months. And that's because they've, they weren't balancing that with the mental safety of their staff to be real, to be realistic. The, the staff were stretched. They were achieving their challenges through having extremely stretched management and worker staff, and it just was not sustainable. And I think that element of mental safety in the age we live in now is of particular importance. So Joachim, thanks very much for bringing that one up. I think it's critical. The more I think about it, I think it's critical. So in step two, Sam, took us through grasp the current condition and three important messages that grasping the current condition is not a waste hunt. Um, uh, sorry, too quick, is not a waste hunt. There is, and there is no need to make it a waste hunt for the simple reason that waste will be removed through striving for a target condition as was illustrated by Joachim in covering step three. Um, the next one, the message from Sam was don't jump straight into problem solving or preparing a project plan when studying the current condition. Very hard habit to break. That's come up several times in the last four hours. One of the hardest things, I was a very, I was an exceptional project planner um, up until 2011. The mistake I was making was not deviating from that plan when it was clearly necessary to do so. Um, and that uh, was really one of the hardest things it took for me to get my head around is that the project plan in its the traditional sense, it, it just doesn't fit with this thinking and it's a very hard habit to break. So thanks Sam for strengthening that message. Um, and the third one, which I, and I know we've got to be a bit careful here because in the practice guide, it's, it focuses and Mike speaks and, and all the stuff he's written about talking about facts and, facts and data, not opinions and feelings. But I, I do think it's important, as Sam emphasised, to grasp the current condition of the people. And Sam stressed that pretty heavily. And how they think and what they're feeling are facts to them. So that what we record as the facts and data is Tommy thinks that and Alan thinks that. That is a fact to Alan and that is a fact to Tom. And we must understand that if we're going to truly understand. I believe we must uh, grasp the, the condition of our people if we're going to really understand the current condition. And the simple reason for that is it will affect how it will affect how they strive towards target conditions. Um, a couple of the points that Sam made uh, that I really liked was this slide here where he talked about the what and the how. Um, and he questioned, one of the questions he used here was what would the customer want to know? Another way I've seen that phrased, and I really like it, is what would the customer want you to see? So to help you study the current condition, if you think if the customer walked into the room here now into our process and was watching our process, what would our customer want us to see? I think that can be a really valuable question to you to ask yourself in, uh, in grasping the current condition. And I'll just go to slide 14. Ah, oh, this summary here that Sam showed us and how he broke it down into the, the what, the how and the why, um, I thought was very clever. Well done, Sam. And in particular, the why is important. We often miss the grasping the current condition and the why tells us here why it's critical to do so. So thanks, thanks Sam, for covering that in the detail. Uh, in Joachim's presentation on establish the next target condition, two important messages. The key word is condition, not target. Uh, and he gave some, a really good example of that. Um, we tend to, and certainly I did this when I first started practicing this stuff in 2012, 2013, is it was all numbers based. And make that worse, it was percentages based. Which And, and using percentages um, just all that usually does is indicate that you don't really understand what the process well enough if you're just going to throw a percentage figure at it. So, so um, emphasis on the word condition was very strongly put across by Joachim and, and I think that's very important. And the other thing, the other thing again, it reiterates what Sam was saying, I think, was um, 
was we don't start with an action plan. Now, that message has come across really strongly. And, and look, it's totally logical when you think about it, because when, when you're at the left hand, the bottom left corner of the four steps, in other words, understand your current condition, you are at your greatest point of not knowing. So from your greatest point of not knowing, what is the logic of developing an action plan? It sort of doesn't make sense when you look at it from that view, because you don't know what's coming. A um, couple of other points that Joachim made uh, was that action plan one, um, as I just discussed, and 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 the the uh, no plan will cover everything, and that is okay. That was me. I, as I said before, I was very I was frightened by that to the point where uh, I sort of almost stopped reading the book and thought, How, how's this going to work? But once you, you can take that internal discipline that I, I was applying to project planning and apply that just as rigorously to the four steps of the improvement carter, and, um, uh, and that's how you then get to where you need to be, not through a plan. The other point that Joachim made and I thought was really effective <clears throat> was this, was the, the, how he illustrated the key word being condition, not target, and that, and that dis, how, how it evolved, this target condition of one side at a time. So it evolved through discussion about the current condition and someone eventually saying, wow, wouldn't it be great if? And you can, as Joachim said, you can tell when you're onto a good thing with a target condition by the way someone says it. Um, uh, if there's fire in their eyes, if there's passion in their eyes, you know that this person is going to strive for that target condition. And and often, as much as I th I'm changing my thinking a little bit here, is that I used to think, I still think, that setting the target condition is the hardest part of, of um, the application of the improvement card or learning to do it. I still find that difficult. But what I'm starting to realise is that the more you, the more effective you are, in under grasping the current condition, that doesn't necessarily mean getting it in the most detail. Um, but the more effective you are in grasping the current condition, the easier it is to identify target conditions because what we find is that they just emerge. What my experience is that if you're effective in your um, of your looking and your listening and your observing, then um, target conditions tend to emerge as Joachim described in this particular case. And, and what I'm also starting to realise is that in step two, under grasp the current condition, the skill of listening and the skill of observing becomes, and putting aside your biases, becomes tremendously important. So uh, again, Joachim, thanks for um, making that message. Uh, Scott Laundry, thanks Scott for your um, your uh, breakdown of the experimenting towards the target condition. Some three important messages from Scott: learning your way forward, not planning your way forward, as a plan is a waste if you don't know what's around the corner. So that really ties in with what I just said. You don't know what's around the corner, so planning your way forward is really a waste of time because you don't know what's coming. Um, and also. Uh, so, and sorry, in using the picture of the raft, if you like, is that the, we don't know what's around the corner. We don't know what's coming next in this river. We don't know what rocks are under the surface. So that picture of the raft there is really quite a good, illust uh, really illustrates that point quite well. Um, Scott also made the point of we, uh, when we're experimenting, we connect the last step to the next. That is, that is the logic of scientific experimentation or scientific thinking, sorry, the logic of scientific thinking. When we connect what we've done next to what we've just learned. So great point, Scott, and thank you. Um, and lastly, a common trip up point, just do the experiment and find out. The main reason for conducting an experiment can often be not to test if something will work, but to learn will not work. So many times I've heard discussions about what people will think and what they'll, what might happen and what may not happen, and we end up saying, "Look, what's the? Hey, you don't know. You're beyond your knowledge threshold. How are we going to find out? Let's conduct an experiment." So well done for um, that message, Scott. Thank you. And a couple of other ones that you made. Um, is 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 I really liked the sometimes you know it took me a while to get my head around plan do check adjust 
for 20 years, um, and putting these simple micro, the words around it of plan, predict, test, try, observe, measure, evaluate, compare. I found that quite helpful. I hadn't seen that before. So perhaps some of you out there can take those words away. Um, and thanks, Scott, for that. Just to uh, help you get your heads around the, the PDCA cycle, which is what's happening in the, the experimenting. And Scott, you, I haven't got a slide, but you said something at the end, which I think is vitally important. And what you said was, as long as you're practicing the Carter, you will learn. So you will learn of what's ahead of you. People, and this is this about project planning and the, the lack of need to be so, to be, to place such an emphasis on that, that you are going to learn. You are going to learn what's around that corner in that raft. As long as you're practicing the Carter, you will get there. You will, the raft will move around the corner and you will see what's next. And it's that belief of practice the Carter and you will learn that uh, it's a bit of a leap of faith, but let me tell you, if you take that leap of faith and you practice it, I doubt whether you'll turn back. So just to finish, I was lucky enough to attend the AME conference in um, San Diego about six weeks ago. And the, this gentleman you see on the screen, Jay Attlee from Zingerman's, um, uh, did a presentation on their application of the Toyota of Toyota Carter, probably one of the best presentations I've ever seen, simply because Jay um, did two things. He spoke from the heart, one, <clears throat> and he told it as it was. He told us of the good things that happened and the bad things, and there was about 50-50 balance of each. But he said a couple of things that really struck a chord with me in terms of the role of a coach. And the, one of the things he said, they're both here, he said, uh, my role as a coach is to provide a corridor for the answers. And I thought that was a, um, a, a brilliant description of what the role of a coach is. And it sort of ties in with Scott's picture of a river. Your role of a coach is to keep that boat um, between the rocks, if you like, or between the two sides of the chasm, um, but not to govern where the boat goes next. As long as it's within the corridor, um, then and you keep the learner within the corridor, then they will find the answers. So my role as a coach is to provide a corridor for the answers, I thought was a brilliant description of what the role of a coach is. And tied in with that, Jay said that each learner is on their own path. That's That can be hard to accept as a coach, to see that each the different learners are heading not in the direction you would head, but they are heading towards the target condition and to be able to let go and let that happen is a is a is a bit of a skill in its own right and 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 takes a fair bit of dignity so as i said it ties in pretty well with um that picture that scott gave us is not every raft will take the same course not every raft will feel the same bumps overall each will reach the next point in the river the next rest place and that represents the target condition and the people in the raft will react to the obstacles along the way based on guidance from a senior raft or a coach. So in the rock walls we see is the corridor as per Jay's quote. So again, I really appreciate uh, everyone listening today and very much appreciate the input of the four people, uh, sorry, three, Joachim, uh, Sam and Scott. And thanks guys for putting in the time and thank you Lean Frontiers for the time you've put into hosting this and remember, the end game is practicing the improvement carter, not implementing it, developing scientific thinking, goal-directed experiments. If you do that, goal-directed experiments done daily, along with standardization, which is a whole different topic, will give us results improving continuously. So thanks, Jim. Thanks, and thanks, everyone, for their time.